Good morning, and I'm happy uh, to be here with friend and longtime Great Connections advisor, Stephen Hicks. This is Marcia Enright from The Great Connections. Uh, we're an organization that offers innovative educational programs to help young people build lives of creative achievement and adventure. Please visit our website at thegreatconnections.org. So Stephen's been uh, a longtime friend and an advisor of our organization, and he's a professor of philosophy at Rockford University for how many years, Stephen? Uh, many. Uh, closing on, uh, well, I finished my PhD work in 92, and so was eligible for tenure track positions, and that's when I came. So 28. 28 years. years. Yeah, I was guessing 30, so I guess I was pretty close. Mm -hmm. And he's quite famous in the intellectual world and even beyond that for his book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. And many articles on, an, on entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial education, including a Wall Street Journal article called What Entrepreneurship Can Teach Us About Life. His philosophy of education course, which is available free online at YouTube, and is um, now being turned into a book called Eight Philosophies of Education with him, with him and his co-author, Andrew Colgan. It's going to come out soon. Do you know when? No. Okay. We just uh, finished the, uh, the, the manuscript, so it's in complete draft form. So the next step will be uh, publisher contacts. Very good. Very good. Well, I look forward to it because I know that I've seen some of the work online and it's superb as always. Stephen is, uh, can't be beat for being a great explainer of history, intellectual history, and, and analyzing uh, what's gone on with ideas. Highly recommend him and his uh, podcast. Um, <laughs> wait, Open, open College. college. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was, it was uh, escaping. It was produced me. out of my uh, hometown in Toronto uh, by a very fine production team up there. So they make my job easy. They, they do a, a wonderful job with it. But, but your content is superb. Half an hour, you're going to learn a lot if you listen to him. I will put all the information about his books, his YouTube channel, uh, his podcast in the notes to this uh, conversation. So if you want to look at that, viewers, I uh, hope you do. Okay, so I've asked you here today, Stephen, because you've been a philosophy professor in the Midwest at Rockford University for many, many years. As we said, I guess 30, but you said 28. What kind of students do you teach and uh, what changes have you seen in them over time? Yeah. Well, uh, my university comes out of the, the liberal arts college tradition. So Rockford was founded in the, in the 1840s. Uh, I think 1847, the college was, was founded. Mm -hmm. So it's got a, a long tradition of uh, small classes and uh, uh, you know, intensive relationships between the professors and, uh, and the students. So uh, we're a private institution and we are not affiliated with any religious institutions. So we get students who are serious about their education because we're charging them a significant amount of amount of money mm -hmm. so they come with uh, with strong motivation to to get a to get a good education and they know there's something about the liberal arts they don't want a narrow technical education as, mm -hmm. as valuable as, as that can be at the same time you know rockford uh, university I, I think of it as a solid middle of the pack university you were not an elite institution mm -hmm. so uh, we tend to get students who are intelligent and and solid but they're not the kinds of students who are going to go to to uh, to harvard or or stanford uh, and so on uh, although we do tend to get uh, you know, a significant minority of students who could perform well at harvard or stanford or any university but they tend to be the ones who were uh, screw-ups in in high school that might be too strong mm -hmm. They weren't mm -hmm. serious about their education. They're smart, but they were out partying and so on. Mm -hmm. and so their grades are not strong, but nonetheless, they have that native intelligence. And then they, uh, they end up at Rockford University for, for whatever reason. So it's a real mix. Well, and there's a, there's a lot of very intelligent students who, for one reason or another, haven't uh, done the extracurriculars or taken all the AP courses. Right. Or, you know, they didn't have good advice 
uh, that makes it difficult for them to get into these elite schools. So. Yeah. Or another constituent is uh, students who are in the area but tied here geographically. They have mm -hmm. you know, elderly parents or they have a job and they're going to university at the same time. So a very hardworking, intelligent and so on. But uh, yeah, so, mm -hmm. so, so they're a good group. Of course, there's always students who uh, do end up, it's a small minority, fortunately for us. Who I'm not really sure why they're at university and <laughs> oh, yeah, right. So they, they don't perform very well, but uh, I think that's a much smaller percentage than standard state schools. Well, and so have you seen a change in the students over the years? Well, yes, I think so. Yeah, I'm trying not to turn into one of those curmudgeonly older professors talking about the younger generation, right? Right, right, so, right. yeah. Uh, uh, th there is a difference. I, I'm noticing a resilience difference Mm -hmm. uh, among the students, that there, there's a lot of failure that is built into good education. You have to try stuff and it doesn't work out and you come back. But I've noticed that students uh, more frequently now give up sooner. Oh. I've got some speculations about why that, why that might be. Uh, so one of the things I've always done is uh, with my students when they, they write essays is I will you know, send them feedback on their essays and, and always give them an opportunity. If you want to work on revising your essay mm -hmm. uh, as many times as you want, I, I will work with it and we will take it as far as you go. Mm -hmm. And students would more frequently take me up on that offer 20 years ago mm -hmm. and do multiple iterations. And now it's a, it's a rarer phenomenon of students who will do mm -hmm. that and they might do it one time rather than, than mm -hmm. multiple. So that's, that's an interesting option. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed is an increasing gap between international students and a kind of homegrown American students. Mm -hmm. in that almost uh, always, uh, the rate of redoing work uh, and improving work among the international students is uh, uh, much higher than Native American students. So mm -hmm. I think it speaks not to intelligence, but to motivation and seriousness mm -hmm levels. Uh, so, so there is that. And then the other thing is, uh, uh, the other side of the resilience is a kind of self-responsibility notion. Uh, you know, the, the idea you come to university and do you think that it's really, it's up to you to learn the system and to figure out what you need to do successfully mm -hmm. to navigate the university system in general in your courses in particular, mm -hmm in contrast to a student who comes and says, you know, what can you do for me? And uh, kind of overstating it, but can you hold my hand and guide me mm -hmm. through everything and, mm -hmm. and so on. So it does seem to be a shifting mm -hmm. uh, in, in a more hand-holding direction. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with the lack of resilience because people who are more confident that they can take care of things themselves don't feel like they need that. Right, or they don't want that. You know, they want to yeah, find yeah. them. Yeah. On their own. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, do you have any evidence about what's causing this or any ideas about it? Well, I have ideas, but I haven't documented the, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the evidence. So I think a lot of it is, <clears throat> you, know, you know, we talk about, uh, um, you know, helicopter parenting and, uh, you know, the, the safe spaces now phenomenon in university, but there does seem to have been over the last 20 years a, a, a lack of letting students when they are children go off and do, mm -hmm. do their own thing. So I think mm -hmm. to the extent that we are shifting in the direction of cocooning children, then that's going to show up 10 years, 20 years later in, uh, in, in university. So I think that's a real social phenomenon. Uh, inside the schools, I think there has been a, a shift to a much more scripted kind of education. Mm -hmm. uh, students are following a recipe, they're following directions, mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that you go further down that road, then by the time one gets to university, particularly in, in, in I think, uh, a liberal arts context where it's supposed to be about you are mm -hmm. a free, self-responsible agent, we're going to treat you as an adult, mm -hmm. that's a more difficult transition for, for students as well. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of something that happened to me about 40 years ago, which was I was working for a pharmacology professor at a medical school, and the president of the medical school came, uh, of the 
class came in to ask what should they study for the final. And the professor gave a beautiful explanation and principle of what they should study for the final. At the end of the conversation, mm. the president of the class said, but Dr. Nair, what should we study? Mm. And I was, I was just like doing this because he wanted the formula. He wanted the exact uh, right. <clears throat> directions about what to do. And I guess yeah. this attitude has gone down into lower school. We, you know, kind of one example I noticed over over many years. You know, I come out of the philosophy tradition, uh, and we, you know we like to pat ourselves on the back as being the, the the queen of all of the humanities or the king, whichever metaphor you like. <laughs> but what's drilled into you there is that all of the issues are complicated, all of the issues are controversial, and you drill yourself in looking at the best arguments for any position, mm -hmm. uh, as well as then the best counter arguments. Uh, against that position, seeking out what the alternatives are, uh, and, and so that methodology becomes second nature. And then, of course, if you're uh, a decent philosopher, your ultimate uh, uh, judgment call is your own judgment call. Mm -hmm. I am a philosopher in my own right. I'm not just a, a scribe for other mm -hmm. people's answers. So that becomes second nature. Uh, but I do remember uh, early in my teaching career, I was teaching some uh, biomedical ethics courses, and we have a very strong nursing program. And uh, this will be partly a criticism of nursing education, but also a testament to, uh, to the, the, the nursing students uh, that, I, that I was mm -hmm. teaching, is uh, we would uh, be doing biomedical ethics. All of these controversial, very controver uh, you know, complicated issues about euthanasia and abortion and informed consent and so on. And the first midterm tests would come along or the first tests would come along. And uh, I would give them philosophy type questions for them to answer. Mm -hmm. And they almost always did very poorly on the first test mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they weren't used to that style of thinking, that there's arguments yeah counter arguments, and then having looked at both of those, what do you think and work it out for yourself as what the best answer was because their education had been up to that point very scripted. You know, mm -hmm. here are the 200 and 208 bones in the human body and this mm -hmm. and memorize them and regurgitate them mm -hmm. as a much more mechanical rubric oriented education. So uh, the style of thinking humanistically and philosophically was, was quite alien to them. But then to their credit, what I found is almost always the nursing students would uh, treat it as a science experiment. Okay, we didn't do very well on this science <laughs> experiment, <laughs> learning experiment. What are we doing wrong? What do we need to do? And then they would come and sit down and you could see their eyes open and say, okay, yes, now we understand it. Yeah. And they would get in together in their study groups and they would start saying, okay, you're going to argue this side. We're going to argue this side. We're going to have this little debate and then we're going to be ready. And they almost all did very well on, on the subsequent tests. I think that's that's kind of ideal, and that's in large part yeah. what liberal education should be doing. But to go back to the first question about resilience, uh, I'm, I'm finding outside of the nursing students, there's a lot of students coming out uh, of high school and so on, who for whom that still is very alien to mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. for various reasons. They don't have the, the resources to be able to take on that project. Mm -hmm. And it's such a contrast. I mean, it's the reason why organizations like Let Grow started uh, to inform parents about all the ways in which children and you know teenagers can be so much more resilient and how to encourage them in that. I, I remember uh, reading an article on there about uh, two kids, it was a celebratory article, two kids in 1905 who traveled, five years old and 13 years old, who traveled from the Midwest to Washington DC by themselves. Mm. And the paper thought this was a great thing and then they later traveled to San Francisco by themselves. Mm. And this was just wonderful. I mean, can you imagine today? <laughs> oh my gosh. Right. Yes, that's right. Remember that reminds me of an anecdote about uh, Richard Branson, the, you know, the famous uh, mm -hmm. British, British entrepreneur. Virgin Atlantic, yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, apparently his parents, and especially his mother in this particular case, thought he was uh, uh, at the same time a disciplinary problem, but then also a little bit too sheltered. So one of the things she did was take him far from home mm -hmm. and basically drop him off and say, you know, he was only like six years old. Yeah. Uh, and, and say, all right, you know, find your own way home. And you know, he did. 
did. Yeah. But he cites this as one of the great you know, learning experiences. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now to go back uh, to our contemporary times, uh, we'd be more likely to uh, look as arrested for, for doing that, yes. And, no, the parents would be <laughs> arrested. Away from her for, yeah, for, for being I mean, that happened, you know, a few years ago with some parents who had their 11 year old and like 11 and eight year old at a park walk home by themselves. They got yeah. turned in by some neighbor yeah. and got in trouble. So it's, it's right. ridiculous anyway. So it's hard to, to quantify a lot of these things, but uh, I, you know, the, the general question you're asking is there does seem to be a, a generational shift. Now there are some greater awareness of the problems and the long-term consequences and there's some pushback in other organizations including some uh, European organizations, especially in Finland and Germany that are trying to mm. work on more, uh, mm. more resilience and, and exposure, getting away from the helicoptering. Mm -hmm. For parents, for, to teach yeah. parents to do that. Yeah, and, and, but it almost seems like an opportunity for uh, the colleges to have some classes or activity. I mean, really activities about it would be best, you know, yeah. finding well, this yeah, the problem. Opportunity. Uh, but I think uh, yeah, colleges, uh, some of them, I think, will see it as an opportunity. My sense right now is that most colleges and universities see it all as a, as a threat. Mm -hmm. uh, they're following the classic pattern of being an entrenched in, uh, institution, mm -hmm. right, locked into certain ways of doing things. Uh, and, and it's very hard for hidebound conservative institutions to think outside the box. So that's true. The sense is that only a minority will reinvent themselves, but rather what will be more likely to happen is new kinds of educational institutions will be developed and, uh, and replace a lot of traditional colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. That's to be hoped. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, that's to be hoped. Uh, in, so you talked about, you think that the way that the students have been educated, they've, they're have they missing out on resilience. Is there anything else they're missing out on their education, do you think, before they, uh, when they arrive at your class? Well, I think resilience, I think, is a part of it. I think another uh, element is that uh, education has become more politicized mm -hmm. in, a, in a certain direction, but politicized is too, too narrow because it's also mm -hmm. A, you know, a broader set of values and ideological elements of which politics is a, is a component. Um, but students are not getting as much the sense that the, the world is complicated and that on all of the, the, the big normative issues, especially, there is legitimate controversy and that they need to be exposed to many or all sides of, of an argument. Instead, they are, they're taught a script, and that script is uh, typically one or a very narrow range of viewpoints right, within that script. And uh, they are, in many cases, actively discouraged from seeking out alternative viewpoints. So in that case, then students do not develop uh, any critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, to the extent that it becomes a uh, you know, the viewpoint that they're only hearing from their teachers, the viewpoint that they're hearing from their peers who, you know, to, who, who imbibe that view, then uh, fear comes to be a more dominant part of their education. Because uh, it's hard to go against the crowd. It's mm -hmm. hard to challenge the teachers at the best of times uh, when, you're, when you're a developing mind. And so uh, fear, and often it's, it's a soft fear, but that can cripple a person's cognitive development. So mm -hmm. they're unwilling to challenge in, in addition to not having developed the cognitive skills to challenge. Mm -hmm. What about the content of what they're learning? Uh, the difference? Uh, well, that, yeah, again, I don't have very good, good numbers to it because I'm a university teacher. So I'm seeing students who are coming out of the pipeline, so to speak, uh, but uh, yeah, the content does seem to be scripted and narrower. The thing that is more important to me is the, is the cognitive style. Mm -hmm. So students who are aware that there is controversy, that my, while we do know a lot of stuff, there's a huge amount of stuff that we don't yet know. Mm -hmm. And so having that attitude of curiosity and being willing to seek out new and unknown 
and being comfortable with the idea that there's just a huge amount that's not known. There's not somebody out there, the teacher, or that I can just look it up at the back of the book, what the answer is, that I'm a, an intellectual seeker or an intellectual entrepreneur. Uh, that cognitive style, I think, is the more important thing, and that, mm -hmm. that's lacking, aside from the, the narrower range of, of education. So, for example, uh, you know, one thing I do notice is, you know, at my university, for example, we have Bachelor of Science degrees and we have Bachelor of Arts degrees. Mm -hmm. And Bachelor of Arts degrees has a foreign language requirement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the foreign language requirement was always a harder sell, you know, 20 years, yeah. more years ago. Yeah. But it's become an increasingly you know, harder sell. So the idea that uh, I, you know, that I, I, that I want to learn more than one language uh, so that I can, you know, for, for all of the obvious benefits mm -hmm. of learning another language, fewer students uh, seem interested in, mm -hmm. in doing. Uh, 20 year 20 years later uh, so we uh, that is one thing that we can document is the number of students who are seeking out the Bachelor of Arts degree uh, has gone down instead they're looking for the easier requirement in the foreign languages the other thing I would say is uh, is math education so part of a liberal arts university is we want students to be uh, kind of that Renaissance man or now Renaissance man or woman ideal of knowing uh, a little bit about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so you know a lot about math and science and the arts and humanities and history and languages and culture mm -hmm. and, and so forth in order to consider yourself a, a wide ranging education. And so, yes, it sounds like a lot of work and math is hard and history might not be very interesting and foreign languages is another kind of challenge. Uh, but it's, it seems to be even more forthright in this generation of students who don't uh, even see the need to learn math. It's not just mm -hmm. they, 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 they came to believe, say, when they were in ninth or tenth grade and things went up a level of abstraction. Mm -hmm. I'm not a math person, mm -hmm. but I still think math is important and I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to uh, you know, learn something about statistics and, and algebra and so on. Whereas now the more common attitude, again, I'm not putting numbers to this, is that I, no, I, just, I just don't need to know math. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need to know foreign languages. Mm -hmm. uh, I can just get this narrower education and that's fine. It's just a getting through. Let, let me just find the easiest way to get through. Yeah. And so a certain kind of credentialism uh, seems to have replaced um, uh, yeah, the, the idea of, uh, of, of a liberal arts education. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, so math and um, was, was one of the things you think in foreign language. And I guess I was asking about what knowledge do you think is missing? Are they not as knowledgeable about certain things as they used to, as students used to be? Well, yes. Uh, well, I do think uh, foreign language counts as a kind of knowledge, mm -hmm. because typically sure. with that comes a lot of literature and history and geography and, and so on. And the same thing for, for math. While math can be taught, I think, badly as just a series of formal systems and, mm -hmm. and, and manipulative things. Math is about solving real world problems. And mm -hmm. so when you work math, you, you work on biology and phys physics and uh, uh, statistics and social sciences. So the content is always is integrated. So there is a, an impoverishment of content that goes, goes along with that. The other one I think I would cite is, uh, is history education. And I think, uh, you know, history can always, again, be badly taught. It's just a bunch of names and dates and so on, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, all these stories about incredibly interesting really? human beings doing right. all sorts of things. <clears throat> and, and this, uh, I think, comes uh, closer to uh, a philosophical uh, uh, issue that a lot of history content education has become impoverished because even many people in the history profession have come to believe that it's irrelevant. Hmm. So the idea of uh, you know, the, the standard cliche, but absolutely true cliche, is that uh, you know, we need to learn from history, and if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to, to repeat mm -hmm. it. But built into that idea is that there are some constants in human beings, that you know, despite all of the cultural differences mm -hmm. and so on, human beings do share a common identity, uh, a biological identity, a psychological identity, and that manifests itself in, in certain constants about values and the kinds of 
cooperations and conflicts that, that can arise. So, uh, you know, we can learn from the Egyptians and the Greeks and the ancient Chinese and so on. Uh, and aside from the, the interesting exotic elements, we can relate and apply the lessons of Chinese history or Greek history mm -hmm. to our own time. Mm -hmm. But one of the uh, philosophical fashions, that's, that's to trivialize it too much, has been the idea that uh, people are just fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. That culture is, is a bottom line, that human beings are more like plasticine, born into different cultures that are completely different from each other. And so people come to think completely differently, they have completely different values, mm -hmm. and that we can't really even understand other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really the only thing we need to do is learn our own culture so that we can navigate within our, within our own culture. Mm -hmm. But then if you come to believe that, uh, then the idea that we're going to study the Greeks or we're mm -hmm. going to study Charlemagne, it seems to be you know, irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different culture. There's nothing that we can possibly learn. Mm -hmm. And so then history becomes irrelevant and students don't, mm -hmm. don't learn as much history. And that then would be a, a content impoverishment. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what's ironically paradoxical about that philosophical position that we can't understand people of other cultures is how did the people who came up with that theory conclude that if they can't understand the other cultures? Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, there's always the, uh, the internal self-contradictions of relativistic positions. Right? Yeah. So that you are making a kind of knowledge claim. You know, so I know these other cultures well enough to know <laughs> right. that these things can't be understood by- Exactly. In that How do you- not in that culture. Yeah. So, yes, so. Yeah, exactly, so. Uh, so so uh, why do you think studying the liberal arts is valuable for students and mm -hmm. what work should they be studying? Mm. Yes, well, uh, yeah, the idea of the, the liberal arts uh, goes back to the, yeah, the root concept of freedom, that uh, uh, the liberal arts are to free your mind. Liberals that, that, are coming from the same root as liberty. Yes. A lot of people exactly. don't realize that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And the contrast, uh, uh, when the idea of liberal arts was being developed, you know, there was a Greek version of it and a Roman version of it that was then lost through much of the Middle Ages was against uh, the idea that there is kind of one truth and that all of the important truths are known and they are held in the minds of authoritative individuals or written in an authoritative scripture book mm -hmm. and that you don't need any sort of intellectual freedom. Instead, all you need to do is be obedient uh, to, authority, mm -hmm. to listen to your teacher and literally regurgitate mm -hmm. what, uh, what your teacher has said or memorize the textbook and on your tests and essay, regurgitate, right, whatever it is. So the idea of liberal arts rose against that, which then is to say, you know, while there may be many truths and important things that the ancients have learned, there still is a huge amount to be discovered and only a certain kind of mind that is open mm -hmm. to new experiences, new data, uh, is going to be, and, and, and willing to look at that data from multiple perspectives is going mm -hmm. to be to, to acquire new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Also part of that was uh, that a, a uh, even to the extent that the traditional views are correct, it really doesn't do you any good mm -hmm. if you are merely parroting that view. You really have to be free to challenge that view mm -hmm. uh, and ask all of the kinds of questions about that view that intelligent people are going to ask about the received view so that you freely in your own mind can see why that traditional view is true, if it is true. Mm -hmm. So you need to have freedom intellectually to be able to challenge the received views, the freedom to look at alternative views, the freedom to go out and explore new territories in order to become the kind of person who can uh, uh, function well in, in, in the world. And then that then works with a content claim that the world is very complicated mm -hmm. And so there are disciplines that have been developed in, uh, in law, in medicine, in theology, in philosophy, in history, in languages, in culture, and in the emerging sciences. And so if you're going to really be interested in the truth about the world, you need to know all of those disciplines. And so a broad ranging uh, content education in as, as well as that open-minded, active inquiry 
literary criticism and debate methodology comes to be characteristic of the liberal education. So then why do I think that is important? Well, because that uh, is the constant human condition. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Now, six or 700 years ago, you know, past the Renaissance. So again, it's a cliche, but you know, you know, we, we say things like the more, the more books I read, the more books I, I, I know I need to read. Right. The, more I know, the more I realize how much more there is to, to learn that is, mm -hmm. that is out there. So uh, being the kind of person who is interested in the whole world mm -hmm. and actively seeking out the uh, inter knowledge from the whole world and having the, uh, the cognitive habits of mind to be able to, uh, to think critically about everything that's going on, that is a, that's, a, that's a constant. So uh, it, it's not set in stone. You know, we are adding new sciences mm -hmm. all the time. I wish that the arts were more innovative than they are, but we have all of these wonderful new artistic media. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all an open-ended potential. Uh, and we know also in our relationships, uh, relationships are complicated. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of types of human relationships and more that are now available to us, but a certain kind of person, a, a liberally educated person is going to be the kind of person who can lead the most, uh, most flourishing life. So mm -hmm. that's the, the general pitch. Now, then you ask the, the second part of your question, I think is, is the hard part, you know, what, what general or what works should students be reading? Mm -hmm. Here, I think, uh, I think it's very hard because there's, there's, there's two things. One is to say that, you know, we're all human beings. And uh, uh, so there's a certain set of core knowledge that we might all want to be exposed to. So mm -hmm. we all need to know how to read, how to write, how to speak well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important if you're going to be functional in your culture mm -hmm. to, uh, to know your culture's basic institutions and basic beliefs. Uh, even, not that you have to agree with all of them, but just to, to be able to operate with your, the people in your, in your cultural group. Mm -hmm. And then to the extent that we are in a more global culture, again, that cliche is, is true, but increasingly true as -hmm. the modern world develops, uh, knowing something about all of the different cultures that are out there in order to be able to function as a, as a practical exercise. So I think then we can say, yeah, yeah, reading, writing, speaking, thinking skills methodologically, that's common, the, the common universal part of, of, of anyone's education. So mm -hmm. logic, math, and, and all of the communication skills and so mm -hmm. on. Then I would say, yeah, some, some understanding of the different political systems that are out there, mm -hmm. uh, the different economic systems, the different religious and philosophical systems that are out there, mm -hmm. uh, that should be a, a common part of anyone's heritage. But beyond that, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to say because the other thing that education needs to pay attention to is not the ways in which we are all the same, but the ways in which we are all unique individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly at a young age, students uh, start to have their own values, their own preferences, and finding their own paths and following their own paths through their lives. So some students are clearly more of an engineering mindset. They like taking things apart. Some are more musical, some are more artistic, some are more scientific, some are more just interested in reading, some are interested in writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, education well done needs to be customized to let each individual pursue his or her own path. And my uh, default position is to have parents and teachers work as individually as possible with students. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, behind that though, I, I do think that wherever your path is, if you follow music, or you follow history, you're going to end up doing all of the other stuff anyway. Because you know, music takes you into mathematics. It takes you into uh, emotional expression. There's a whole history of music. There's all the different mm -hmm. cultural traditions in music. There's all of the science and engineering that goes into making musical instruments. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's passionate about music uh, is going to end up getting a full liberal arts education anyway and i think the same thing happens wherever you start because it's all connected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very very interesting very interesting um you know we have we still have thousands of brilliant creative people working in the u.s mm. on technology on business on sports 
Uh, how is their lack of education in the liberal arts affecting them? Yeah, I, I think I would parse that question out a little bit. I uh, I think uh, you know, despite all of the flaws uh, of, of the contemporary system, students still do get a good education. What do they do not get is good schooling. Hmm. And, I, and I think that despite the very rigid narrow kind of education and actually demotivating and in many cases dehumanizing education that students are exposed to in formal schooling. Outside of school, mm -hmm. American culture, broadly Western culture and now global culture is very rich with opportunities and so on. So you know, it's a bit of a stereotype again, but the, the stereotype is true. You know, if you, if you say, what does school mean to you when I say that word? You say, what's the school day like mm -hmm. the vast majority of us the image that is coming to mind is rows of desks mm -hmm. right and students then sit in in a place and they typically sit in the same seat mm -hmm. day, in, day out for the entire school year mm -hmm. and all of the students then listen to the teacher and they make their notes right and they do what the teacher tells them to do and the teacher might lecture to them and i'm not a, uh, opposed to lectures there can be great lecture mm -hmm. But it's, that's only one tool. But the teacher has the answers, and your job is to learn what the teacher tells you. Uh, or everybody's working on the textbook, but they're all doing the same problem at the same time, in the same way, and they have to finish at the same time. Yeah. But then that communicates a certain model of passivity, mm -hmm. uh, even to the point you know, where you, know, you, you want to go to the bathroom, right? You have to you know, ask permission to go to yeah. the bathroom. Uh, kind of a mildly dehumanizing sort mm -hmm. of thing. But then you think, what's that like for a young child for day in, day out, for a whole school year? Sit mm -hmm. in rows and do the same thing that everybody else is doing, mm -hmm. and you better pass the test. If you fail, then we will come down hard on you, a certain yeah. attitude of failure. And you do that for a year, another year, another year, another year, another year. That is not education. Uh, that is uh, that, that is the opposite of education. So, my my heart goes out to all of those students who rebel, mm -hmm. particularly as they are going through adolescence and uh, and find various ways to subvert the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ferris Bueller. That's right. To, to keep some flame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ferris Bueller is, should be the role model, right? <laughs> the hero to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that's, a, that's a good, now I want to watch that movie again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but despite all of that, outside of formal schooling, you know, culture is rich, partly because we're a rich culture, you know, but, but kids are taking all sorts of music lessons and sports lessons and, uh, and, and they do learn a huge amount from video games and from television. Yeah. And they teach each other with all of these social media tools. I'm a big fan of pretty much all of those things. Mm -hmm. I think the benefits of them vastly outweigh the, the downsides uh, as well. So we, uh, and we do still have a, a culture that broadly celebrates the hero's journey, finding mm -hmm. your way, yeah. you are you're special, uh, and, and so on. So uh, despite the dehumanizing, in many cases, miseducation or anti-education, uh, informal schooling, uh, we still do have a rich educational culture. I, and I think I that's why we still... Mm -hmm. Uh, are able to uh, to have a significant minority of students who are are uh, very innovative and, mm -hmm. and so the other thing I think is uh, the uh, you know despite recent years the steady stream of uh, of immigrants who come in mm -hmm. still do have a, an entrepreneurial generally immigration friendly culture mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, you know, and there is some documentation of this that the people who tend to be the most creative and the most mm -hmm. uh, innovative a very high percentage of them are, are immigrants yeah. so to the extent that we succeed in attracting the them from around the world we uh, we can assimilate them and benefit Lucky them. in that respect yeah 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 well let's hope that we can keep the culture to be as uh, thriving and full of information and learning opportunities as possible uh, to, to help counteract this other trend. The other anecdote I would throw out there, and it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an overstatement, but it's beautifully, beautifully stated. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a remark from some, uh, some European entrepreneurs who uh, were very cosmopolitan. They were also doing business in the United States and 
practically all over the, all over the world. And uh, their, uh, the comment, essentially, and I heard of this in a couple of different forums, was to say, uh, America has the worst 18-year-olds in the world. <laughs> In terms of coming out of formal schooling, right, what they're they're ready for life and so forth, but America has the best thirty-year-olds mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what they they were basically saying is the American school system is crap. Yeah. <laughs> but once students out of the American uh, school system and into the business world, America has the best business culture in the yeah. world. And those students uh, basically they get their education in their twenties and they become mm -hmm. outstanding. The market ends up uh, normalizing them in that respect. Yeah, that's right. You know, Michael Barone wrote a book about that called Hard America, Soft America, or Soft America, mm. Hard America. And, and uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but. Yeah, yeah, bit, about 15 years ago, I think I read that. So okay. uh, I, it, it struck me as completely true, seeing what goes on, you know, so. But that was interesting about the German, uh, uh, the Germans observing it. I mean, certainly what, one of the things you hear from immigrants that come here that's, is that there's no place like the U.S. for being able to start wherever you are. It doesn't matter what social position you have, mm. what connections you have. And if you work hard, being able to rise to what other, you know, to heights. Mm. And, and you'll see, hear that over and over from people from all kinds of different countries who say, no, it's not possible in another country. So it's no. not possible in my home country. Yeah, no, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm big on uh, the, the immigrants, and they're they're genuinely recognizing why America still is an, an exceptional place. Mm -hmm. So to come back to formal education and, and your earlier question, I'm just reminded of another another anecdote. One of the things that I uh, will frequently do, aside from offering students rewrites of their essays and working with mm -hmm. them, is, uh, uh, you know, makeup tests on on exams, and I. Every, every year I teach a logic course and the logic course for some reason is almost always 50% homegrown American kids and 50% mm -hmm. immigrants. Mm -hmm. and I've noticed a pattern uh, that typically the first logic test, nobody does that well on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I always offer a makeup test mm -hmm. and almost always, almost always, 100% of the, the foreign students will take the makeup tests. Mm -hmm. and, it's rare that an American student will take the makeup test. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, know, you take your first logic test and you get a C on it. Uh -huh. uh, if, so your, if your mindset is, oh, I got a C, I guess I'm okay with that C, yeah. I will the makeup test. That's one, one thing. Uh, and, and it's disturbing that, that level of complacency. So the immigrant students, even if they are not geniuses, they're nonetheless, they have the, the work ethic. They got a C. Oh. <laughs> I'm yeah. not happy with this. People. I'm going to take that, that makeup test. Right. So. Well, you know, it's partly, the, I think the point of view of the American student is I'm just trying to get through to get my credential of having a, a yeah. college degree. I'm not really interested. In, they've learned from earlier education that it, they, authorities don't really care if you actually know the stuff or you're interested in learning just mm. if you're giving them back what they want to hear from you enough. Yeah. So if, you, if, you've, if you've learned enough of the information that you can give it back to them uh, the way they want right. to hear it. I know, I, I know I've seen this where if you take a, a essay test and you don't, if you paraphrase whatever uh, the subject is about in the, in the essay test, often the person will be um, marked down for that. That what the what the person correcting the test is looking for is certain terms that were said in the the course instead of understanding of those terms. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So yeah, the first part of what you're saying is that compliance mindset that that feeds mm -hmm. into the credential. So there's just a certain set of expectations that other people have for me my parents, my teachers, my future bosses, and so on. Mm -hmm. And my job just is to satisfy right. uh, whatever I need to do to, to comply. Instead of the more entrepreneurial right, mindset where I want to be the best person I can be and be the fullest life I can be. So I see my education as an opportunity to grow as a human being. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a huge gulf. Yes. And I mean, I think, I think they've often been... 
um, punished in a certain way if they try to do things their own way or try to be do things out of the box. Oh, they're, absolutely. They're basically punished in the way the edu lower educational system has worked, you know. Yeah. Well, that's a, yeah, a dehumanization that, uh, that is, yeah, there's a certain number of students, uh, sorry, teachers, of course, who are not really teachers. They are ideologists in various sort of political, religious, mm -hmm. environmental, right, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They have their viewpoint, and yet yeah, any deviant student, they will punish that yeah. person as well. A large amount of it, though, is, uh, is, uh, is institutionalization, uh, where it's very hard for various institutional reasons to, to get rid of bad teachers, mm -hmm. teachers who are really just there because you know, it's, it's a pretty good financial lifestyle and you get the summers off and there's very little accountability. So uh, that kind of teacher uh, just wants to teach a recipe, doesn't want to actually deal with <laughs> the creative thinking students. And so they will find various ways to punish those students who are not just following the script. Well, there's another practical reason why it happens, which is that the schools are being uh, are being given money by the federal government, depending on how many kids pass certain standardized tests. And so that puts the pressure on the teacher to get kids to be uh, doing well on the standardized tests. And that disincentivizes teachers, even the ones who want to, from teaching outside of that framework. Uh, and, and having the students do anything outside of that framework. I'm afraid that you have frozen. Then oh, you, you, froze, you froze there for a while, so. Uh, okay, yeah, you froze from me, so, okay, but we're back now. Yeah, anyway, all right. Well, this is of I, go oh, ahead. Uh, I was, I was saying it disincentivizes teachers from, from encouraging the students to want to do things outside of what they need to do to take these standardized tests because the teachers are getting pressure from the administration to have their students, the maximum number of students do well on the test so that they can get money from the federal government. And that's, that's a big problem, so. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah un unfortunately, uh, well, I teach this course on philosophy of education, which is uh, uh, for students who are ambitious about their teaching careers. And I've had any number of students who stayed in touch over the years, and they will come out of school or uh, university, age 22 or so, very ambitious and idealistic about their teaching career. Yeah. And, and in some cases, they're, they're back five years later to get another degree because they've been so demoralized by the system Mm -hmm. that they realize they just don't want to be teachers anymore and mm -hmm. they go in, into some other field. So yes, and, it, and it's for exactly the reasons that they are, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to move on because I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, mm. But I wanted to go on to a, a last question I had for you, which is, uh, or I got a notification. I couldn't fa can't figure out how to turn it off. It was very um, popular. Yeah. Uh, so I think you've been a shining example of objectivity in teaching. And mm -hmm. one, of the, one of my evidence of this everybody can know about is that you taught a course on Marxism that was online. You had it, recordings of it online. And some years ago, some uh, reporter from Breitbart saw it and, and then wrote about you as you were a Marxist. Mm. But um, you had to straighten him out about that because, of course, no, you're a classical liberal. And right. in terms of your own uh, views. Fun anecdote, yeah. What? Uh, it is a fun anecdote, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you did such a wonderful job of presenting Marxism in a very uh, balanced and objective way that he was actually obviously fooled about that. So what do you think um, w teachers we as teachers can do to help students against teaching that lacks that kind of objectivity or is yeah. purposely slanted. Yeah. Well, what I do, uh, the, the way I do it is particularly with my uh, freshman students or my first year students is uh, just to affirm to them that when they go to university, uh, they will have many kinds of professors. They will have some professors who are ideologists and just interested in indoctrination. 
and uh, just to learn to to recognize when you are dealing with that kind of mm -hmm. kind of teacher. And I, I recommend them as a matter of uh, self defense to plug into the student grapevine as soon as they can and get all of the information about the about professors. You know, if I you know make a, an argument mm -hmm. for another kind of view, am I going to be downgraded by this professor or or that mm -hmm. professor? Mm -hmm. uh, I actively avoid the indoctrinating professors and seek out the professors who are genuinely interested in in education. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, uh, yeah, then I, I do tell them the the mantra that uh, you know, by the time you are getting to higher education, higher education does mean something. All of the controversial, uh, complicated issues are controversial and complicated for a reason. Mm -hmm. And when you are at university and beyond, you will recognize the people who are the experts in the field. They have disagreements with each other. Mm -hmm. And you know what those disagreements are. And the good professors will expose you to what those disagreements are. And whatever the viewpoint is, good professors will, uh, will, will welcome the criticisms and themselves point out what the criticisms mm -hmm. are of those viewpoints. So become a, a savvy consumer uh, as, a, as a student. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is an important an important point. Um, the other thing I say to students is that uh, um, if, if you're not getting that at university, uh, make sure that you go on and actively seek out what the alternatives are because you can find right, what the what the alternatives are. Mm -hmm. And that for your own strength of mind, mm -hmm. uh, almost any position, can be given a good gloss and made to seem like a reasonable position and so forth. So to realize for yourself, whatever position you are, you are hearing, there is a criticism out there. There is another way of framing that data that's worth a look at. Mm -hmm. And so actively seek that out before you make up your, your own mind. So um, uh, it, it used to be, you know, there, there always are ideological teachers in any generation, and we have a lot more of them in this generation for various reasons. But uh, uh, to the extent that students are, are aware that there are alternatives, and that gets reinforced by at least some of their liberal arts-oriented professors, they, they will get the message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, I had a thought to go along with it, but of course it fled. <laughs> the other thing that I that I typically do in my first year's classes is I make a point of never letting the students know what my views are because they don't they don't know me. I, you know, I can mm -hmm. say we you know, just argue something well and you'll get a good grade, uh, but they don't know me whether I'm lying about that or or not. Sure. Uh, so the idea is that uh, they're they're not in a position to uh, to really know what my views on an issue are until they're up to speed on what the issues are, what the complicated mm -hmm. complications are, what the range of positions are, are and so on. So uh, the way I always teach my, my first two years courses is you know, whatever the issue is, we're always reading mm -hmm. two or more people from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. and it's just, mm -hmm. Here's the argument, mm -hmm. here are the counter arguments, here's the other side's argument, here are the counter arguments, and I leave it at that. Mm -hmm. and at this point, now you're up to speed, of course, you'll make up your own mind and so on. So right. the example of the Marxism uh, is, a, is, is a good example mm -hmm. of that. So part of my job is whenever we cover something by Marx is to make the arguments as strongly as possible, mm -hmm. but also the criticisms mm -hmm. of Marxism as well as that. So it's not until students are juniors and seniors that in classes and outside, I'll let them know what my, my views mm -hmm. are because then they know me and they know yeah. that I'm not going to downgrade them. Mm -hmm. So they're they're confident, but then they're also they're more up to speed. So then, mm -hmm. typically, what happens is we do the same thing. Here's the issue, mm -hmm. here are the arguments on one side, the arguments on this side, and now you're up to speed on that, but at a higher level. And mm -hmm. then I will at that point and say, and I think this side is the the correct side. Here's my reasons why and why I think this criticism of the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I've got students from all over the religious, ideological, political, mm -hmm. and so on. Sure. So. They're they're typically stronger minded at that point, and they will mm -hmm. they will uh, wonderfully argue with me. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. That's good. Oh, that's wonderful advice to the students. Everything that you've said, and even it I got an even further benefit, which is if you if students of anybody tries to pay attention to the best arguments from both sides of a controversy, 
they'll actually, if they see that, well, the other side has some reasonable ideas there or some reasons mm -hmm. for what they're saying, then they're okay. more inclined to have a good conversation with people from who take that point of view. So yes. they can actually have a productive conversation with them because okay. you're, you're um, giving them the benefit of the doubt and saying, okay, I think, yeah, I can see where you have some merit to what you're saying. And then you can exchange the ideas and the information about it to try to get somewhere in a conversation. Absolutely. So you mentioned uh, the, my eight philosophies of uh, education book that's, uh, that's newly finished. My co-author, Andrew Colgan, he's a younger Canadian PhD in philosophy of education. But one of our motivations for that book is uh, exactly the point that you're talking about. Those of us who are parents and, uh, and teachers and, and going to be administrators in education, we're going to be having thousands of conversations about education. Mm -hmm about what the content should be, what the methodology should be, what teachers we should hire, how we assess the physical layout of schools and so on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we need to know going into that profession is that people are coming into it with very different philosophical mm -hmm. ideas about what education should be. The mm -hmm. only way those conversations can be productive is if I have some knowledge of those other perspectives. So some people are coming in as, as, as pragmatists or as religious mm -hmm. idealists, right? Or, mm -hmm scientific realists or objectivists, Montessorians. Mm -hmm. And so we all have to know something about our perspectives mm -hmm. uh, in order to, be able to, uh, to, uh, to have fruitful conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, you, you probably pretty much answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, is there anything else you can suggest to help students develop their own objectivity? Hmm. Well, yes. Um, I mean, on, on the cognitive side, uh, there, there's lots of good material out there about how to pay attention to the data, how to try to look at the data from different perspectives, uh, seeking out the alternative viewpoints, and uh, putting yourself in different intellectual shoes and so on, uh, being aware of what various kinds of cognitive biases that people can be prone to, uh, uh, taking formal courses in logic, statistics, mathematics, mm -hmm. and so on, develop your, your, your skill set. So you know, our minds potentially are an enormously powerful tool. Mm -hmm. and you need the tool clean and sharp, and, uh, and, and there's always a more powerful <laughs> version of the tool. You can get the software mm -hmm. upgrades, and that can be, that can <laughs> yeah. be a, a lifelong, lifelong process. The other thing that I would say in terms of objectivity is uh, on the character side of, of mm -hmm. cognition. Uh, a lot of times, uh, failures of objectivity come from a kind of laziness that, mm. that, uh, that objectivity and learning takes work. And we know that, and mm. in many cases, we want the path of, of least resistance, or we've got a, a pretty good idea, and we just don't want to think about something anymore. Mm. So to, to school yourself to say that it really matters that I have the truth, or at least mm. the best possible answer, mm and not to be complacent mm -hmm. and satisfied with the easy answer or just the first answer that you mm -hmm. come across and mm -hmm. so on to go, mm -hmm. to go that, extra, that extra mile. So mm -hmm. in a way, it's a kind of like physical conditioning. We can all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be kind of pretty good shape and so on, but really to be more ambitious and to work out more frequently. The same mm -hmm. thing that mm -hmm. goes to uh, not be an intellectual couch potato, right, so to speak. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, uh, but that, that's, a, that, that's a character trait about developing that habit mm -hmm. of active mindedness and so mm -hmm. on. The mm -hmm. other thing is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's about courage, but uh, the, the negative side of courage and what courage is all about is, is fear. And uh, I think in many cases, a failure of objectivity is because people are afraid. In some cases, mm -hmm. they're afraid that they will have to, uh, to, to, to change their minds about something mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to them. And that, that, that's hard uh, to be able to say, you know, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. on something. It's just, don't just say it to yourself, let alone yeah. to say, say it publicly. Because well, we know it, bruises, it bruises your ego. A lot of people you know? give you grief about various things. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying it bruises your ego to admit well, yes, that you did something right. that you may have made a mistake. Yeah. Or that's how a lot of people feel. Yes, and well, it is in one sense a, an ego bruising, but the, the way I like to come back to that is to say it really is 
the sign of a strong ego to be able to say, I made a mistake. Yeah. Because we all make mistakes. We make a huge number of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the sign of a person who actually has strength of character mm -hmm. is to, uh, to, to be able to say to yourself, I was wrong about that. That's, mm -hmm. that's the fact of the matter. And that really I am interested in truth. I'm interested in improvement. Uh, and that signal, that, that actually is the thing that takes us the strong ego. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, or, or to, be, to be willing to, uh, to, to, to go against the flow, because we do know mm -hmm. that our peers exert conformist pressures on us, mm -hmm. and they punish deviancies. And so objectivity uh, often is, you know, if you have some questions or some doubts about what seems to be the prevailing viewpoint, to, to let those slide and to suppress them in order to go along with, with the group. So that becomes a courage issue. How you know, diplomatically, but nonetheless mm -hmm. firmly stand up for your own thinking mm -hmm. and to the questions mm -hmm. that are going to, to, to make uh, the results more objective. And the other kind of fear that we grapple with is in uh, hierarchical social context as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So it's hard to challenge our parents, our teachers, our bosses. And actually, again, strong egoed teachers and strong egoed bosses mm -hmm. are going to encourage criticism. They don't want a bunch of conformist mind mm -hmm. followers. Nonetheless, it's hard for students, it's hard for employees mm -hmm. to, to raise those questions, to say, well, maybe there's a different way, way of yeah. looking at it. So uh, work on your courage, uh, work on your active mindedness. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the, the two important character complements to whatever sets of objectivity uh, right. uh, one needs to acquire. Wonderful advice. You know, um, the, the person in the last instance where it's your teacher or your uh, employer, you, have, you might have some material fear that you're going to lose your position or right. you're right. going to get a bad grade and all that. And the other instances, I, I always try to encourage people to be loyal to the truth and to get their sense of self-esteem from the fact that they're loyal to the truth. So their mm -hmm. ego is more tied to being loyal to the truth. And in that sense, then when they're, when they're wrong and they admit it, they actually can feel kind of good about themselves. Well, I'm being loyal to the truth. I'm, I'm proudly admitting that I was wrong because the truth is more important than me believing something. Yeah. And I like the advice that entrepreneurs will, will often give you know, to say that if you're, if you're not failing a lot, if you're not making a lot of mistakes, you're not doing it right. Yeah. And that word is, is generalized and fits exactly with, with, uh, with what you're saying. But then I do think it then becomes a, a, a responsibility of good parents, good teachers, and good bosses because they are all aware that uh, their children, their students, and their employees are worried about sanctions against yeah. them. They say the wrong sort of thing to go out of their way to make it clear mm -hmm. that that's not going to happen. Exactly. To actively encourage, and, and and I would actually just say to to reward students for mm -hmm. asking uncomfortable questions and uh, reward employees who uh, who raise uncomfortable mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. I haven't worked this out, but I uh, uh, partly on the history, but the idea of the king's fool. So oh yeah. Uh, being a king and all of those weighty, incredibly difficult decisions you need to make if you're going to be a good king, yeah. and everybody is aware of your power and that you could have them beheaded at, at the moment, yeah. to have an official person whose job it is is to, uh, to, to criticize in, in a mocking way mm -hmm. whatever it is that you are, you're thinking about, to, to, to encourage the fool. Mm -hmm. uh, so we all need that. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful and very informative conversation. A which, pleasure for me too. Yeah, it, this is it's great. I hope that we can uh, get this conversation out to a lot of people. That might, I think mm. it would be very helpful to parents and and t parents, teachers, and students. Mm. Um, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. And once again, I will put all the information, uh, anything that we refer to on in the notes to the conversation. Um, I was thinking, for example, there's a blog called Less Wrong that has all kinds of discussions about ways in which we can have cognitive errors and how to, how to uh, make them better. You know, so hope to have a lot of resources for the viewer. 
And uh, once again, this is sponsored by The Great Connections. We're an educational organization. Please visit our website at thegreatconnections.org. Thank you. Thanks and a lot, Marcia. Real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.